Mr. Port, Steve, thanks so much for joining us today. I know that uh, the last time we saw each other, we were in the hallways kind of packing up and into the school year. So we appreciate you taking some time out of your summer to do this podcast with us. Why don't you start off by telling our listeners a little bit about who you are and how you got involved in engineering as a kind of a curriculum for students? Right, sure. Um, you know, I, w I went, to, well, you kind of have to go back to my, my, um, my college days because um, I was I was studying to be a um, an architect, and uh, um, at that time, you know, they, everything was on the boards. It was manually drawing, and computers were just coming on the scene. And I had a professor say, you know, you really ought to get into this CAD thing and uh, computer aided design. And uh, it was just in its infancy at that time. In fact, when we went to we had to sign up to uh, to get into the labs, you know, and most of the times were like three in the morning that you could get in there and you could only sign up for an hour at a time. And literally these these CAD stations, you walked into them. It was like a Star Trek, uh, you know, um, you know, bridge. You literally, you were surrounded by terminals. You know, it was a micro station or a CATIA um, and there was these monitors all over the place and, and you had to code in your, your commands, you know, it wasn't as much um, visual based. Anyway, um, I was in a class and um, one of the professors, he was my favorite professor at that time. Um, and uh, he, he stopped the class and he asked how many of us that were studying to be design engineers were interested in, um, in being teachers and not a person raised their hand. And it was really stunning because there were probably 200 people in this arena style class. And, uh, and um, he kind of choked up and broke down. And he, he said, you know, <clears throat> you know, it gets me that way to think about it. He says, you know, I know you guys are worried about, you know, providing for your families. You want to make a good living and all that stuff. I get that. He says, but if you would consider teaching, you would never regret that a day in your life. And when he said that, um, it felt like he was just talking to me. And um, almost that day, I went and changed my major to industrial arts education. So instead of learning to, to draw, and I would teach students how to draw uh, engineering drawings. And so that's kind of where I got there. So I, I come from a drafting background. That was, that was my emphasis, was in woodshop and, and um, graphic arts. I'm not graphic arts, but I did graphic arts as a minor too, but um, just engineering drawings. And um, so, yeah, and that's uh, that's seen me through. I mean, I started teaching uh, woodshop in 1988, and um, on Merritt Island, and um, took over for a teacher that was retiring after 30 years. So there was quite a tradition and a reputation to fill there. And um, uh, about in his, his early 90s, uh, this idea of technology education came out, and um, I don't know if you remember Betty Castor was the commissioner of education and. She, um, she started a, a, a request for proposals, an RFP for conversion of industrial arts laboratories to technology education, which here, you know, technology education was the idea of learning about all the different technologies and, and, and getting some just, you know, basic literacy to understand, you know, the different technologies that are, are coming out and the high technologies that are available. Instead of doing you know, wood shop. If you think about the administrations uh, in the on the country at that time, there was the big dot com bubble and all that stuff that was happening, and everybody thought everything was migrating to the web, and we're all going to be totally information. We're not going to do any hands on anymore, and we basically, you know, threw that baby out with the bathwater. You know, it's like okay, we're we're going to get give China all of our menial tasks, and we're just going to become cerebral. <laughs> So they, they basically disbanded all these wood shops and um, practical arts programs, you know, nationwide. And not only that, but the, the worst thing was they disbanded the teacher education programs that, that fulfilled them. And uh, when I had the chance to, um, um, you know, to meet uh, in Washington with um, um, the director, the deputy director of OSTP, um, I asked them this question. It was, it was. Uh, I like to put him on the spot about that, you know, because I said, you know, we're talking about this maker movement with 3D printing and all this stuff, and I said, basically, you know, we've given away our capacity to make things. You know, the idea of making things by hand has 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 been gone, 
you know, and now that we've given that away, we're looking at this maker movement going, oh, this is so wonderful. We're going to make things again, you know, and we basically gave up that capacity, you know, and so it's almost like we're coming around full circle. And uh, as, as you talked about earlier in the pre-conference, uh, you know, I, I, I pitched this to uh, our principal and, and they were excited about it. And that is to bring back a wood shop uh, in the school. And uh, she's absolutely thrilled about it. And I'm pretty excited about it. Cause I mean, when you, when you work fundamentally with your hands, you know, I, there's something just, you know, uh, primeval about that, that, um, that, that, uh, that is just fundamental to all humans is making things and the satisfaction of making things. And I mean, when you, when you, when you do things, you know, all electronics all the time, the kids are constantly like this, you know, they're, yeah. everything's a virtual world for them. Um, in fact, so many of them are absolutely jaded, you know, uh, when it comes to, you know, doing things amazingly um, with their own capacities and, and hand handiwork. Because, um, you know, they see things on TV, they see things in movies, they see things in their video games that we don't even have the capacity to do yet. I mean, literally, the technology is beyond us. So that when something amazing is done, they, just, they yawn at it. It's just like, oh, hum. <laughs> you know? their, their grasp of reality is uh, fictional. Right. It's a it's a there. Uh, yes. I want to back up for a minute. And, and thank you for sharing that. I have known you for some time. We met at the National Science Foundation, probably on the 11th floor, uh, probably the old NSF building. But you mentioned some dates in the late 80s and 90s moving forward. But I would like to know what you were doing before you went to college in your late teens uh, wow. there on the Space Coast, because for our listeners, you are you are a resident of the Space Coast and have pretty much lived there your entire life. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, yeah, sure. Um, you know, my dad came down from Wisconsin. He was a dairy farmer and he vowed he would never get up at three in the morning and milk cows in 20 minus 20 degree weather. And so he came down to Florida and he couldn't get him to go back. And so he uh, he had graduated from DeVry in Chicago. Uh, so he was a technician and he started on the Polaris missile program and that got into Apollo. And at, at some point in time, he actually was um, uh a command module officer where, you know, they did everything uh, but actually fly the Apollo spacecraft. They did all the testing and check out and they worked very closely with the astronauts on that. And he didn't get to that status until um, the Apollo Soyuz program, but, you know, so he was uh, a pr premier electrician. And then when I graduated high school, um, shuttle was coming on board and um, my dad said hey there's talk that uh, you know they're hiring tile techs you ought to put in for it so I did I mean it was a thermal protection installation mechanic I know it sounds all highfalutin but what we did was we we licked them and we sticked them you know we, we stuck we stuck the tile on the shuttle and um, I was probably the youngest hired uh, technician to work for Rockwell doing that. I was 17 years old and I was working on the shuttle Columbia. So even, so even then you were doing hands-on work, right? Even that oh, was yeah. very, very yeah. manual, right? Yeah. yeah, and we did a lot of things, you know, I, I kind of had expertise in drawing. And so when tiles would become damaged, we had to disposition them, you know, we had to measure them. We had to define the defect, where it was, how deep it was, where it was located you know, adjacent, adjacent tiles and gaps and things like that. And, and I was quite good at drawing. And so a lot of times I would do drawings for the people and we interfaced closely with the, with the engineers and got the tiles dispositioned and repaired and, and, and whatnot. So yeah, I did that for two years um, before going to college. Um, I mean, I literally, you know, as a, as a 17 year old, I was making about 25 grand, you know, this is back in the late seventies. <laughs> I right. remember, I remember when I went to school, I had my taxes done uh, by somebody else and, and I was out to school and, and the person's looking at me and they're looking at my taxes and says, you have a very unusual income for a person your age. <laughs> right. Right. So uh -huh. I had this, I had this opportunity. I could have made that a career like my dad did, um, you know. But I, I just there was some there was something in me that just couldn't couldn't handle that. I, 
I got into teaching. Um, I don't know. I, I taught when I was uh, worked with the Navajo people on the reservation uh, as a as a um, as a young missionary. And um, there's something I don't know. Maybe you guys can it, it relate to this. But when you teach somebody something and you see that look of recognition in their face, you just get all tingly. You know, your spine. You just you know. I feel it now as I'm as I'm saying it. And um, it is it is a one of the kind type of a feeling. And I realize not everybody's cut out for teaching, but for me, that was just such a cool feeling, and it never never goes away. And so I've always loved teaching. So. Well, I want to go back a little bit to what sounds to me like the Votech kind of career education that most of us, well, I mean, you know, at least the three of us kind of grew up with. And I laughingly remember my shop experiences, you know, where I'm in there with a group of guys and a few other girls that were kind of required to take it. And I was, you know, what, did I make something amazing? Nope. Yeah. But I walked out of there with, with something. The same was true with agriculture I had to take and, you know, like some kind of computer typing class, as well as like home economics back in the day. We never see anything like this anymore. And it sounds like um, you're bringing that back. So for our younger listeners who might not have an understanding of why it's so important to be able to build something, to be able to use tools on your own without having to pay someone to do it, what would you say is really missing in our current focus on education that maybe we should revisit from the past? Uh, well, it kind of gets back to what I was saying about virtual, the virtual world we live in. Um, you know, there's so much missing that's tangible. I mean, you know, you, you might not have felt very good about, I mean, you might not have felt you did a, this, this perfect, you know, birdhouse or whatever you happen to be making. Um, you know, I took, I took, um, I took home ec and I, uh, I cooked and I, you know, did a little bit of sewing. Um, yeah. you know, that was a cool thing. I spent the summer working with the people at the, um, at the, um, parachute ref refurbishment facility those parachutes that would bring down the shuttle boosters you know there was three of them on each booster so they had to refurbish uh, six of those um those parachutes and they were 130 feet across so there are three of them so we we're talking about you know each one of them weighed uh, about a ton uh dry and and so you go in there and literally sewing machines you know you see sewing machines and and men and women didn't matter they work side by side and they they were just great seamstresses, if you will, you know, sewing those those uh, parachutes back together again. Because what would happen is those parachutes would deploy at about 600 uh, miles per hour, and so that that nylon would come shredding out of those 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 uh, packs, and uh, it's just like you know playing on the carpet and you get a rug burn. That's what would happen is that nylon would would burn because it would come out of the pack so quickly. And so they would have to test the, the damaged area and they would use a Tinius Olson pull testing machine and literally just tension it, tension it, tension it until it popped, you know, like a shotgun going off. And then they would look and they would, they would examine the fabric and they would say, you know, this is uh, how much damage it had and this is how much strength it has. And then they start to build an archive of, of, of engineering data to understand, you know, when things were okay to fly, a certain right. amount, minimum amount of damage and when it had to actually cut out and and, um, and repaired, you know, so that again, we get back to the idea, you know, you, you might not have thought it was the most amazing thing in the world, but probably at the time you were very proud of yourself because you wow. did it. Well, right. not just that. I, I think like just nowadays as an adult of what I'm not able to do. And most oftentimes it would be something that I know that a parent tried to teach me along the way, like even changing a tire and I'm willing to just pay somebody, even when they, if, painting my house, right? I'll pay someone to paint my house, whereas my brother feels that my grandfather is watching from heaven, like rolling over going, why would you pay anyone to paint your house? These are skills I think that ultimately we have gotten used to. And, and I think education is partly to blame for this of just letting someone else do it because we're too busy doing something else. And I think that ultimately these kinds of skills, these hands-on applications really lend themselves to the higher level thinking that is needed. And it, not only that, it makes you more employable in almost every job that you do because you're able to see things from a different perspective. You're more creative, perhaps, in your approach. You're able to solve problems that many of us who don't have those skills are able to do. Sure. And, and let, me, let me add on to her team. I, I want to ask you, because I know you have some, uh, some serious strength and skills and experience in team building, 
small teams and the engineering design process. So I'd like you to share anything you'd like in sort of that arena of how do you work with small groups and help them accomplish big things? Well, you know, you model it after after industry as much as you can. You know, that's that's a real big problem. You know, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with um, the next generation science standards that, uh, that came out and that was gonna be the next greatest thing. And there were all these prescriptions and, and it was important and it was good. And, and, and anything we can do to improve our standing, you know, internationally in the science areas is, is gonna be beneficial. But they made some prescriptions for engineering, which were so, so out of focus and uh, almost almost deranged, <laughs> you know, because they were having science teachers, you know, try to teach engineering and what science teacher knows anything about engineering, you know, I mean, all engineers have to go all, you know, all engineers have to go through science to get the engineering, but no scientists have to go through engineering to get the science, you know, so the I mindset, see that. the engineering mindset is totally, totally different than, than, uh, you know, scientific mindset. You know, and, and so, um, you know, the, 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 you know, we have to start fundamentally, what, how's it done in industry? And I think, you know, Kevin would agree that when we model industry, you know, model our educational practices by what industry is doing, that is very beneficial. It's very accurate. It's very authentic. Right. So much of what we do in, in education is so far removed from a real world, world experience that it, it's, it's almost obscene. Well, you, you know, have people making educational decisions that haven't either been in industry, if it's something related to that. So yeah. then you're just teachers doing that work. But even more often, there's not even teachers involved in making those decisions. It's political, you know? Right. And, and I've always said, you know, you look at the STEM, it's, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math. And, you know, the important parts of that is the T and the E, the technology and the engineering. You know, the, the, the ends we know, the science and the math we know. You know, and then you look at most uh, educators, um, and especially the administrators of, educa uh, of ed education, and they don't understand the technology and the engineering world at all. So that there's 50% of STEM that, that, that most people that are setting policy don't even understand. Do you, you think know? it's, let me just ask you this, do you think it's fair to say that they assume that those two content areas, right, are, are basically like subject areas versus industry. So if you think about what you're saying, engineering and um, the, what was the other technology. one? Technology. Those are careers. It's different. It's it's really encompassing an entire industry versus, okay, we've got a textbook here for science and math and you may, you know, incrementally go, but it's definitely a different, it's a, it's a paradigm shift to be able to recognize that if you really want to create the citizens of the future, you have to prepare them for a workforce, not just to pass a test to go on to a college. Yeah. Yeah. So the yeah the thoughts there you I mean you're right you're right on because you know we're just gonna we're gonna open we're gonna write a new textbook and talk about engineering and we're gonna you know and we're give them iPads and that'll satisfy the technology requirement and that's totally so far removed I mean it just totally exposes their in inability to understand what the the intent is and and the idea is when you're doing engineering activity you are creating technology see so any engineering activity which does not have a product is not engineering activity. You don't just sit there and read about engineering and expect you know that to, to be meaningful for students. And so, um, you know, and then and then you show that relationship between the science. You know, the science uh, is about the discovery, and then the discovery is used in like materials and stuff. So you have material science, and then the engineers benefit from that, and then the engineers design something like a, an optical instrument, like Hubble Space Telescope, and that increases scientific exploration, and it just keeps on feeding. Right feeding each other like that but um yeah so so yeah so when we we need to model everything that we do after um after what's happening in industry and that's that just speaks to the need for industry and education to be really closely aligned with one another you know but you know it's like the stem thing you know that's been so funny to watch you know uh the the one the one fellow i love the quote he says something like you know these these subject areas have been you know discrete and separated from each other for you know hundreds of years and you think a four letter word is going to bring them together <laughs> you know right. you know so and then and then you have a lot of people that resent stem because they're they're the arts and then they say well well they're not you know so you have you know you have stem you have 
you know, STEM R because now we need reading or stream, you know, because reading is important too. And then we have, you know, STEM C because now we got to, you know, it's just all these things because, you know, you know, STEAM because the arts are important, you know, and it's, that's not the point. The point is, is that, you know, um, you know, GNP is, is created in a nation by, you know, by invention and by technologies. You know, and that's not to say the arts are important. It's just that when you integrate these subject areas, you get basically what happens in industry. You know, I, I read uh, a Henry Ford quote that he said not a single one of his inventions did he not look at with having an eye toward how it could help out mankind. Right. He was very practical in what he wanted to do. I'm sorry, I said Henry Ford, but I meant Thomas Edison. Uh, yeah. Thomas Edison was very focused on the benefit his inventions would bring, you know, how to help mankind. I thought yeah, that was very interesting. Yeah, and to speak back to the arts and stuff, it, you know, again, STEAM is not to be taken away from the arts at all. In fact, you know, if you look at those intersections, those intersections of, of you know, engineering and, and computers and stuff with these other unre seemingly unrelated areas are where there's a great treasure trove of of capacity and, and, and invention that is possible. I mean, look at Steve Jobs. I mean, his, his best class, his favorite class that he took in college was calligraphy. That's right. And he took that, he took that calligraphy class and he basically made true type fonts on a Macintosh computer. And that revolutionized the computer, uh, you know, at becoming the first desktop publishing. The Macintosh was the go-to computer for desktop publishing because of what Steve, jo Steve Jobs did with respect to the arts and technology. So, you know, it's not to be downplayed whatsoever. It's just that when you integrate those subject areas, you basically have industry. And so, you know, if you're trying to do a good STEAM program, you've got to go back to industry and say, how do you do it? You know? <laughs> we, we, we met with a former, um, a former principal recently on a podcast who ex expressed exactly what you said, that it has, it's integrated across the curriculum. It has to be. And when we, when we talk about putting it all together, it's simply because it's become a funding mechanism, right? So like if you call something STEM, then there's a way to get to get money right. versus the idea that it's not excluding, it's not exclusionary mm -hmm. of every other thing. It's just that within those areas, everything must come together to be a really good education in order for a child to fully see how it fits in everywhere else. Right. Ahead, sorry. I, I was just going to say, I think math has become, the, the older I get, the more I think of math as simply the language that we must speak in order to do science, engineering, or math. It's it is the glue that holds it all together. Without math, we're just you know beating our heads against rocks in a cave somewhere. Yeah, that's how you quantify. It's how you quantify results. Right, right. Um, so I know for a fact that you have published numerous times. Uh, you're a prolific author and a content curator. How about share a little bit with our audience some of the things you've enjoyed most creating, either your books or uh, papers, things of that nature, and uh, also point us to where we might find them. Oh, boy. Um, I know I don't have a, a repository of something like that. Uh, I almost said suppository. Um, <laughs> we will leave that in the recording. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, you know, I, I when I had a web page uh, in my former employment, I had all that in a, in a place where I could share it. And um, a lot of that stuff, you know, the, the web page was taken down um, by Brevard County. And so, I mean, I had one of the, the most amazing web pages, you know, back in the day when people didn't make a web page, you know, you know, they, they mm -hmm. uh, I had my own and there was a lot of um, on demand training that I provided my students via that web page. And when they took that down, that was, that was a very sad day. But um, anyway, um, so, uh, you know, some of the, again, talking about intersections, some of my best experiences, I had, I had the most amazing thing happen. I don't know, you know, most men, they, they have a difficult time dealing with the female side of things, you know, and I remember when I was dating my wife, um, you know, she, um, she took me to a musical and I always, you know, you, <laughs> You bl she blindsided me with this thing. It's like, what is this movie we're going to? Oh, it's called Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. You'll like it. And I go, what? You know, I've never seen that before. And when they start singing, I go, oh, you totally set me up. 
because men don't like stuff like that. It's, that's nonsense. I mean, where's this orchestration coming from in this cornfield? That doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> you know, forget the fact that we have to, you know, suspend physics for Star Wars movies, but, <laughs> but anyway, um, so, so I had a total aversion for musical and theater and stuff. And, and then when I built my house, we designed and built our own custom house here um, because I was a poor teacher and I couldn't afford, you know, to buy a big house. And, you know, when, when our youngest child is sleeping on the floor and his clothing are in boxes under the bed, you know, it's time to get a bigger place. So anyway, we built a house. And when the uh, uh, director of career and technical in Brevard found out that I built my own house, they said, they, you know, they suck. They, 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 they stuck the um, community college on me and said, hey, get this guy to build your theater sets for you because he, he's really good at building stuff. And, and so I, I got hired as an adjunct professor at Eastern Florida as a theater, um, uh, you know, theater arts instructor. And I, 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 I built sets for five different plays that were just absolutely amazing. And, um, you know, um, it was some of the best experience that I ever had um, as far as learning, opening up my own horizons and, and being able to do something that wasn't, you know, in my wheelhouse, as Kevin would say, but right. it turned out to be something quite amazing for me. Um, you know, I, I guess I, I do that as a little bit of a diversion because I know what you asked me about my, my, my papers and things like that. But, you know, it's like that and five bucks get you a cup of coffee or, you know, a hot chocolate at Starbucks. People don't care about that. Your principals don't read your resume. They don't read the things that you ever wrote. They don't know what your expertise is. You know, it's like, you know, principals are like children. You know, they don't, they don't read your, they don't read your resume. <laughs> you know, so what good oh, that, is all that's that? definitely going into the podcast. So <laughs> what, what, what good, what good does all that do? You know, if, you know, you have this expertise, but nobody cares, you know, so yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I've been on a couple panels. Uh, Kevin, you've been on panels. You know, I got called to, to, to appear at Olin College of Engineering in, in New York and I'm sorry, in, in Boston. Um, and, um, you know, I was on a panel in at Florida State uh, for, you um, 3D printing technologies and, you know, pontificating about, pontificating about, you know, what it's, what it's, uh, what its future is going to hold and how it's going to impact students. I mean, you know, one of the projects we did was with a, a, a manufacturer there um, here in Brevard County, and um, they actually build um, weapons systems and um, they wanted to do a partnership with us. And so we said, well, what could we do? Let's build something. Let's make a mold and injection mold something. And the students came up with this idea where they, they made this picture frame. It was going to, it was just like a five by seven picture frame, you know, along the lines of what they might do for, um, you know, yearbook stuff, you know, they're going to get their pictures and photos and stuff and they put it in this frame and we were the vipers. And so the idea, they had like a viper motif that they engineered into it where these little fangs were coming in the corners, you know, so it looked a little snake, snake like, but it's basically just a plastic picture frame that was injection molded, but the students to their credit, you know, they en engineered it and uh, they wanted it to be something that could hang on the wall, either vertically or horizontally. So they made provisions for that. And then they said, you know, it should hang in the locker too. So let's make it magnetic. So they made some magnetic catches for it. And then, and then that's not enough. They, they put a backing on it and said, you know, let's make it so that it can stand up and you can put it on your desktop. And so they made a little back for it too. And then um, Knight's Armament, which is the company that, in, that I'm talking about, they uh, injection molded it for um, the students and they built so many of them. The students got to assemble them, they packaged them and, and they sold them. And that is an authentic experience right there. Right, yeah. right. From ideation to manufacturing. Yeah, right. Yeah. And of course, they took the facility. So they watched the manufacturing all the way through the process. And I mean, if you don't get, you know, a genuine experience from that, nothing's going to give you a genuine experience. Well, as we're about to close out today, uh, we normally ask kind of a, a question about general advice. Do you have anything you want to ask before we close it out? Um, no, I just, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm all in, uh, I'm in agreement with her about your uh, advice question. Well, so let's say today you were able to have the ear of those educational politicians, the administrators who are making the decisions. Let's, let's just even keep it as simple as the state of Florida, if not the United States. Give us uh, your best advice for why we should go back to implementing hands-on 
engineering into a regular everyday classroom? <clears throat> um, you, know, you, you mean like more of the manual arts or? Yeah, like mean? if you were to give a, if you were, what advice would you have for it? Let's say administrators or politicians who have to make decisions about curriculum in regards to engineering education? Well, we gave up capacity, you know, um, when we, you know, when we relinquished the idea that we were going to have a community or a, a, a population that can work with their hands. You know, this whole maker movement has been just amazing. I, I love it. Um, I mean, I started 3D printing in 2004. I put the, the first 3D printer in a high school in the state of Florida. And so I've been doing this for a long time. Um, you know, but, you know, you see the pendulum swing back and forth. And, you know, um, I mean, I wrote, I wrote this amazing article and I was so proud of myself for writing it. And I shared it with my uh, professor that I was collaborating with at the University of Virginia. And, and he's kind of just shook his head and says, well, you know, it's just so much tilting at windmills, you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, nobody's going to listen to you. You know, so I'll, yeah, I guess if I, I was king for the day and I could, you know, do whatever, you know. Um, you know, you should always have people be choosing the technology which is most appropriate. You know, so if if the idea is to, you know, you know, do something, you know, do you need uh, a table saw or do you need a coping saw or are you going to 3D print it? You know, what are you going to do? You know, the, the children need to use whatever technology is the most appropriate for what what they're going to be doing. You know, if they're going to build a bookcase, that's not going to be 3D printed, you know, so they probably need to use some saws for that. Are they going to go to Ikea and buy it? You know, I mean, the Swiss will love that for, it. you know, they're, you know, we're, we're buying stuff from them, right? Because, you know, or are we going to get some, some particle board with, with some plot, with some, some, uh, you know, uh, wallpaper on it, you know, is that what we're going to buy? We're going to buy, you know, some, some you know, particle board that just has wallpaper, a wood grain on it. Is that the sort of quality that we want in our houses? You know, what, what do you want? You know? Um, so it seems like there's this, I'm just hearing from you there and it makes me think a little bit. So the idea of a quality of a product really comes down to the engineering and that technology that you put into it. So what we either make is the equivalent of what something that we can show pride in. And I think that there's a big difference, right? In between sometimes what we can just go and buy versus that which we create ourselves. Well, sure. You know, I mean, I always thought it was funny because when, when people immediately, when they find you have a woodshop program, they have all these projects that they want you to make. But they say, oh yeah, you could have the students build this, but they don't want student quality. They want your quality. So that means, Mr. Ports, you're going to make this for us. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, you know, it's been a little, little bit of trepidation that I've even considered, you know, bringing back and reviving a wood shop. But I just think it's important for students to be able to do this, you know, be able to, to do things like that. Yeah. Well, I, I, I have known you, Steve, for over a decade. And I remember the day we met uh at the old nsf building at the national science foundation uh i've been privileged to work with you for uh five years and uh you know i appreciate you as a friend and uh i know you're very good at what you do and i hope that our paths are going to keep crossing so that we can keep working on some projects together so we yeah. want to thank you yeah, for joining us today lot, really. for the uh the podcast. And if it's okay with you in the links in the description area, uh, I might ask if I can link to some of your material, if there's anything in particular you want me to link to, um, or if there are particular articles that you, you I would be happy yeah, to do. If you, if you just do ports and STEM, you'll probably come up with my um, article. It's a white paper that um, I wrote for the, um, the Space Congress. Uh, it's in several um, okay. academic yeah, I'll link it. That's awesome. probably, okay. probably the best one. Got All right. It. Well, right. thank you again. And uh, it's always good to, to see you, Steve. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. yeah. You guys have a great summer. Thanks. All right. Hold on.